So I'm going to go ahead and start, even though I think um, there are probably still some people that are going to be joining us this evening. But I just want to say welcome. Thank you for attending our virtual community lecture series. Um, we're always really grateful to the community for participating and very much to our speakers for participating as well. I'll come to introducing them in um, just a moment. Perfect. First, I want to um, say a word of thanks to um, uh, some particular people from the Stem Cell Research Center, but also from UCI Media, Brian Cummings, who is the director of our community outreach program, Judy Beck, who is director for our communications um, program at, at the Stem Cell Research Center, and also Will Alvarez and Kyle Good, who um, are just really um, phenomenally supportive from UCI Media in terms of not just this program, but when we're able to do our in-person program um, pre-COVID and hopefully coming back again in the fall. So most of you know, many of you will know that our program within the Stonebill Growth Stem Cell Research Center is really built around um, the three pillars of the College of Health Sciences, Discover, Teach, and Heal. Our idea is to conduct groundbreaking basic science, preclinical, and translational research, research that is going to move things out of the bench and to the bedside to teach, educate undergraduate, graduate medical students, and future scientists that will work not just in academia, but at high schools, at colleges, at universities, at companies um, all over California, in fact, um, all over the nation. And really, ultimately, our vision is to drive regenerative medicine uh, therapies from the discovery stage into actual clinical treatments and therapy delivery. And that is our, our goal and our mission. We have over 63 faculty that are distributed across six schools um, at the University of California, Irvine. And this is a really wonderful example of how broad and interdisciplinary our program really is. Tonight, one of our speakers happens to be um, a SEED Award recipient. And so I thought I would just say a couple of words to that. One of the ways that we participate in this enterprise, we try and drive translational research forward and um, move uh, research that's from the discovery stage on into clinical therapies is with the SEED grant program. This has been very successful over the last five years or so here. We've raised about $450,000 of SEED funding, but really pivotally that has translated into additional funding of almost $12 million. So about a 25 fold return on investment from our SEED grant program into new federally funded or foundation funded research programs that are based here at UCI. And I thought it would be important to highlight that because of course, one of the things that we get asked and um, uh, something that we like to convey to the community in answer is how can I help? And you can participate, you can sign up for our e-newsletter, follow us on Facebook, visit our website, watch more of these videos, which are all archived there, but also importantly, you can make a gift. While research is a very critical aspect of what we do here at the university, a very small percentage of philanthropic donations nationally go towards basic science and translational science research every year. And so we need your help. Um, with that, you are here at the Sue and Bill Gross Stem Cell Research Center Virtual Community Lecture Series. Again, we're really pleased to have so many people from the community continue to participate, although we very much miss seeing you in person and we're looking forward um, to having that opportunity coming up soon. Today, our topic theme is stem cell insights into epilepsy, seizures in a Petri dish. Um, our speakers are gonna be Jacqueline and Diane O'Dowd. I'll come back and introduce them in just a moment. But before I do that, I wanna highlight that on April 20th, we have a special presentation. In pre-COVID times, we would normally be having our stem cell science symposium, um, actually a couple of months ago, but we had delayed as long as possible, hoping to be in person. And at the end of that, our keynote speaker always gives an evening public lecture. These have been really phenomenal, phenomenal events um, that we've hosted at the Beckman Center on campus here. We're very sorry not to be able to do that again this year, but we are going to have a virtual lecture um, in the evening from our keynote speaker, Loren Studer. And he will be speaking about his work developing induced pluripotent cells for therapies for Parkinson's disease and other neurological disorders. He is an outstanding speaker, a highly respected scientist, and he's gonna give a wonderful community lecture. So I hope you all will look ahead to April 20th and joining us then. For the moment though, I want to introduce our two speakers just briefly. First, Jack Lynn, who is a professor of clinical neurology and director of the UCI Comprehensive uh, Epilepsy Center. He is a member of the Department of Neurology, a professor of biomedical engineering, a professor in the Department of Anatomy and Neurobiology, and the vice chair for research in the Department of Neurology. 
It is too much to list all of the awards and honors that he's accumulated, so I've highlighted just a few here. He's a fellow for the American Epilepsy Society Orange County Physician of Excellence Award in 2018, a rising star in epilepsy um, uh, selected by the editorial board of the Journal of Epilepsy. And he's received a number of other awards, including the Stanley, Stanley Vander Nord Award for junior, junior Faculty Research and the Fritz Dreyfus Award National Epi Fellows Foundation. Our second speaker this evening is Dr. Diane O'Dowd. Dr. O'Dowd has been uh, at the University of California, Irvine for, I won't say how long, but probably coming close to 30 years. Um, she is a Howard Hughes Medical Institute's professor, HHMI professor, which is um, an amazing honor to hold. Professor in the departments of developmental and cell biology, as well as anatomy and neurobiology within the School of Medicine. She's also our vice provost, provost for academic personnel, um, where she is highly respected. And she really has too many awards and honors to list. Um, so I've just noted a few of them here. Many of these revolve around her excellence in teaching um, and her stewardship and leadership on campus. For example, the 2014 Chancellor's Living Our Values Award. With that, I just want to highlight a couple of words on format for how things will work this evening. We'll have our speaker presentations. Dr. Lynn will start, followed by Dr. O'Dowd. And uh, you can place in the Q&A box at any time questions that you would like to have answered as a placeholder that um, come up. We will answer them in real time, or the speakers will, if we can. Um, otherwise, I'll be collating those, and we'll have a Q&A session at the end where I will ask those questions on your behalf. You can continue to ask questions at any time. Please understand if I don't ask your exact question, I may be trying to wrap it together with a couple of others that we received, but we'll make sure that you have time to be able to ask your questions and get them answered. With that, Dr. Lynn, I'd like to invite you to start your video. I will mute and stop my presentation and we'll be ready to go ahead with our themed speakers. Thank you, Dr. Anderson, <clears throat> for the very kind introduction. And let me just put my slides up. So it is such a wonderful honor to speak tonight with everyone. And uh, thank you for joining us this evening. So this is a bit of an interesting topic. And uh, hopefully, uh, I can tell you two um, stories about one about a human and one about a sea lion and how both of them teach us about how to treat people with very difficult uh, to treat epilepsy. So first, I just like to uh, highlight the fact that epilepsy is one of the most common neurological disorders. Um, in fact, it is the fourth most common neurological disorder behind migraine, stroke, Alzheimer's disease. Over 150,000 new cases are diagnosed each year in the United States. And right now we have 3 million people in the United States that have active epilepsy. So this is really a lot of people are suffering from this neurological disorder. And I have devoted much part of my life in helping people with these very, very difficult to treat epilepsy because you know, it's, 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 it's such a common problem. You can see that other people are also very passionate people in public like you. This is a photo taken from uh, November when it's, it's epilepsy day. And you can see we are all coming together um, to fight for uh, um, uh, um, research dollars and, uh, and uh, new methods and new treatment for people with, with epilepsy. Certainly current treatment with epilepsy is not, still not optimal. So why is that? Well, let's look at uh, um, the most common way that we treat people with epilepsy. Um, so it's, this was a study that was a, a pretty important study that was done in 2000 by uh, um, uh, Patrick Kwan and Martin Brody. And this was published in the New England Journal of Medicine. And they asked a very simple question. How many medications do you have, uh, does a, a, a patient not respond and that would determine that they would not respond to any other medicine. So what are the chances a patient will respond to one medicine, the first medicine? And that number is 47%. Now, if that medicine doesn't work to control that person's seizure, then 
what is the chance that a second medicine will control the, the seizure? And that's about 13%. And then, well, let's, you know, we have so many medicines, you know, prob so let's, how, how many medicine do we need to try? And it turned out that one more medicine will give that additional 4% chance of making somebody seizure free, either that medicine or combination of those medicines they've tried. That leaves of roughly one third of the people with uh, um, what we call drug resistant epilepsy, that they don't respond to medicine. So the good news is that two thirds of the people will respond to medicine who have epilepsy and become seizure free, but then one third will not. And so, you know, you got you know, people in the public may ask, wait a minute, um, you know, Dr. Lena, I hear so many commercials on TV and, and, you know, there's so many new medicine and they all say they do so much more. So uh, this is in 2000, this is more than, you know, several decades ago, um, what's going on now? So this is sort of what's going on now. So when you look at the, the, the all these new medicine that's been uh, uh, approved by the FDA, what happens if you look at this graph that in the old, in the eighties, most of the people are being treated with some of the older generation medicines such as carbamazepine, valproic acid, and phenytoin or dilantin. But then at this point, this is where that original study was done at, at, in 2000. And then this point on, you've got all these new medicine. So shouldn't people do better with these new medicine? Well, unfortunately, no. Um, it turned out that again, about half the people will respond to the first medicine, even with all these different choices. And then an additional 12 or 14% of people will respond to the next medicine. And a smidgen of people will respond to the third medicine. After the third medicine, they won't respond to any other medicine. It's not because they won't respond, but because they have a type of seizure that just won't respond to medicine. It doesn't matter how many you try. So from, the, from the, 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 the drug discovery point of view, at least for these general type of, of seizures, uh, we really haven't made that much progress. So how do we treat with uh, people with um, epilepsy in terms of, 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 and what is the mechanism of, 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 of this problem? So the way that, the, the, so we're gonna step back a little bit and say, you know, what is a seizure, right? What is a seizure is that when the brain, there's an imbalance between the amount of excitation and the amount of inhibition. This is, uh, you know, this is the typical, uh, you know, um, playground, if you will, you got to kind of balance off the, this excitation and inhibition. Um, and, and there are many uh, um, uh, um, channels and, 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 and uh, neuronal activities in the brain that allows the brain to, the cells to fire and the firing of these cells create excitation. Well, there, but then too much firing of that cell, you need to sort of dampen down the electrical activity. And that is bad, balanced off by inhibitory neurons. And one of the ways that that, that seizure happens is when you have a, a loss of inhibitory neurons, making the brain too excitable. So when there's, the brain is too excitable, then what happens is that seizure or electrical storm is created. So one of the ways to balance this overexcitation is to give people medicine to reduce that excitation uh, um, and, and balance this uh, um, system up. But unfortunately, that sometimes doesn't work as I show you. So what do we do next? Well, um, the most effective way when medicine um, don't work, uh, medicine, uh, um, people are not responding to medicine is using surgery. And so this is my little analogy of a, a scalpel. And we do, you know, physically remove uh, um, area of the seizure, such as over here, this patient had a temporal lobe surgery to stop the seizures. Or now we can have laser uh, ablation where we put a laser probe in the brain to uh, get rid of this area. So one of the things that, that we need to do to, 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 to find out where the seizure is coming from is putting probes inside the brain to localize where the seizures are uh, located. And this is done with a 
combination of, of, of people and robots. And this is a ROSA robot that can help us to act as a GPS system to navigate, to put these electrodes where they're supposed to be. So I'm gonna tell you a little uh, story about uh, um, um, Jasmine. And uh, Jasmine, is, I have permission to show her video as well as her story. She has been in a, a number of media uh, outlets such as the uh, LA uh, Times and, 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 uh, and uh, some of the uh, um, TV news uh, broadcasts as well. So she's well aware of this, but she, she's really a remarkable woman and her story is extremely touching. Um, she's a 25 year old teacher with recurrent seizures since the age of eight. And almost all of her seizures occur when she, uh, she's asleep. And uh, uh, during the seizure, she'll raise her arm like a ballerina. Here's a little picture of uh, the goss dancer. Uh, um, so she'd make this pause, uh, this posture. And I'll show you that in a video in, in a second. And she'll have almost every night, she'll have multiple seizures. And when she saw me, she's, she tried five other seizure medications without success. And she was already on three, and these medications were making her drowsy and groggy. But she is somebody who has the most difficult to treat type of seizures because not only is she not responding to medicine, but when you look at her brain scan, there's no abnormality. And when you even look at your the, the brain waves recorded from the, the surface of the brain, there was no clear abnormality. But so here is her seizure, here's Jasmine's seizure. You can see that she, so that fairly subtle seizure, she'll raise her arm and extends the other one, such what I call a ballerina pose. And if, if she was awake, she in fact would make a little circle turn. Uh, um, so these are very disabling to her and, and you know, she cannot drive. She, she, to her, she's never had a good night of sleep since the age of eight. So, um, so what we did was we put these probes, as I told you earlier, into the brain to find out where the seizure is coming from. And luckily we were able to localize where the seizure is coming from. And then we pinpoint it with a, a more uh, um, precise localization with these grid electrodes over the surface and map this area. And the end, we took out this part of the brain right over here in her frontal lobe. And this is about three centimeter worth of the brain. Now, the good news is that this is Jasmine and she's done extremely well. This is me and that's Dr. Frank Su who performed the surgery. And she now is able to sleep peacefully and uh, she actually, uh, 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 you know, now has assumed a full-time job as, as a teacher. So Jasmine is extremely uh, lucky and, uh, um, you know, she was able to do this, but not, you know, this type of surgery only when the people, about half of the people seizure free. So the success of this type of surgery is only 50%. So how can we do better? Well, one of the things maybe is to rescue these cells rather than take the cells out. So we talked about before this lack of, 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 of balance between inhibition and excitation. And some of the work that was, that's coming from uh, um, my colleague uh, Bobby Hunt's lab and before that when he was at UCSF with, uh, with Scott Beerbohm is that they are able to transplant stem cells into the hippocampus, one of the most active area for seizures. And these green dot represents progenitor uh, stem cells that are able to spread and then live in these areas, and these are inhibitory stem cells so that the balance of inhibition and excitation can be restored. So here comes Cronet. Cronet give us the, the hope that maybe in the future we can restore people's brain with stem cells. So Cronet, uh, you can look up Cronet, is in New York Times now um, as a wonderful story, but he's seven year old sea lion and in November, 2017, all of a sudden, she walk, he walked into a parking lot in San Luis Obispo. And then later on, they actually tagged the sea, uh, the sea lion and released it. And later on, he walked into a residence, climbed onto a porch table and, and, and you know, it was really, people think that this is kind of, uh, you know, comical, but in fact, these sea lions are very confused. And then in Ocean Beach in San Francisco, uh, 
the sea lion was so confused and walking toward people that people were feeding the sea lions burritos. And uh, then um, Six Flags at the time was able to rescue the sea lion, but the sea lion started having just overt uh, grandma seizures. And they give the sea lion medicine that you'll give to humans, such as phenobarbital and Valium, but the sea lion wasn't responding. So in fact, um, what's going on is that as our ocean warm, algae are blooming and widespread. And these algae produce a type of toxin that are ingested by sardines and anchovies. And these anchovies and sardines are typical food for sea lions. And when these are, are ingested, then um, they're toxins. And in fact, this type of toxin specifically target part of the brain called the hippocampus. Um, this is uh, 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 some pictures from Dr. Um, Paul, uh, Buck, Buckmeister's work uh, um, showing the fact that there is uh, these areas the of sclerotic hippocampus with lots of neurons in, 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 in these uh, um, uh, um, brain leads. This hippocampal sclerosis is, is the most common type of epilepsy uh, that is uh, uh, um, become refractory to drugs and the most common type of surgery that we do for people with drug resistant epilepsy. So in fact, um, uh, the, a team from UCSF um, performed stem cell transplant from pigs uh, um, into uh, the hippocampus. And as far as we know, and Krona actually has his own uh, um, um, Twitter account, so you can follow uh, uh, Krona. But Krona now has been seizure free. So it, it, it gives me hope that one day we can actually rescue brain cells in patients with epilepsy using stem cells. So I'd like to thank the incredible team that I work with. Um, we have five talented, dedicated um, epileptologists. Um, and then we have two wonderful neurosurgeons, Dr. Su and Dr. Vadira, who, who performs the surgery. Wow, Dr. Lin, thanks for that fantastic um, presentation. I would like to invite you to stop sharing your screen for the moment. Um, Dr. O'Dowd, if you could start screen sharing. Um, we're doing fantastically in terms of time. And so without an additional introduction, I'll ask you to go ahead and begin your presentation. Thanks. Hello, everyone. And can you see my slides? Hopefully you can. Um, good evening, and I really want to thank all of you for coming today, joining us, and I want to thank the organizers for inviting me. And for the next few minutes, I'm going to be talking to you about our work modeling seizure disorders with human stem cells. Um, okay. See, um, as you just learned from Dr. Lin, epilepsy is a common neurological disorder and approximately one in 26 people will develop epilepsy in their lifetime. And you also learned from Dr. Lin that it's um, a condition in the brain that causes the body to have uh, seizure activity. And it's the result of a disruption in the balance between um, excitatory and inhibitory electrical activity. So um, something that excites things and something that dampens them down. And there are a variety of causes of epilepsy, which include diseases like infections, stroke, injury, um, like concussive head injuries. However, there are also individuals who have genetic mutations that result in epilepsy that start in infancy. And this is the type of epilepsy that my lab studies. So SCN1A is a gene that encodes a channel that lets sodium ions into the neuron. And um, neurons are the cells, the major cells in the brain. So this cartoon illustrates um, with the yellow uh, material of the membrane of a cell. And the blue structure is to illustrate a sodium channel that allows ions to flow from the outside of the cell to the inside of the cell. And these are positively charged molecules. So they are creating the electrical activity in the cell. Um, there are literally hundreds of mutations throughout the sodium channel gene that can cause epilepsy. 
And each person though that has epilepsy usually has only a single mutation. And so by these X's on the channel, I'm illustrating places in the channel that there could be a mutation that has been linked to epilepsy in a person. But to treat the seizures, we really must find out how each mutation um, breaks the channel to alter the flow of sodium ions into the cell. And so a mutation is really just something that breaks um, the channel and we have to figure out how it's broken to be able to fix it. Okay, so to illustrate this more concretely, I have brought with me today into my room a, um, a what my students call a garage demo. And this is a door. I call it a garage demo because it's made out of things in my garage. And I want you to think of the sodium channel in a cell like the door in a house. So imagine that you're sitting in a nice warm house and it's a cold day outside. And when the kids, want to come out in from playing in the snow, they open the door and my door has a spring on it right here. And so it closes with a, a relatively rapidly and a predictable fashion. So when the come, kids come in, just a little bit of cold air comes in. Now imagine that my spring is broken. And so when I open the door, the door stays open and a whole lot of cold air comes in and that's really unpleasant. So I'm gonna wanna be able to fix the door. So I could call somebody or I could go get a spring to fix the door. But you could also imagine that my spring on the door is just fine. I have to fix it again, is just fine. And you open the door, but it stays open and in this case, there is a wedge in the door jam that is causing it to stay open. So in this case, you would not be able to, if you went to fix the spring, it would not fix the door. So the sodium channel is the same way. You have to be able to know what's wrong with the sodium channel to be able to fix it with a drug that would um, allow the um, cell to regain its balance of excitation and inhibition. So we can't easily look at sodium channels in the brain of a living patient because Dr. Lin was showing you pictures of the brains um, in people and the neurons, there are billions of neurons in the brain and the sodium channel is just one part or uh, there are many, many of them, but it's a small, tiny part of a small, tiny cell. So to solve this problem, what we've been doing is to make neurons from patients with sodium channel mutations. And so in this slide, what I have shown is a, a cartoon boy. Um, and we take a biopsy from the arm and are able to obtain skin cells. These skin cells can then be reprogrammed. So they um, uh, form stem cells. So they are basically de-differentiated. They're no longer skin cells. And then using um, particular factors, you can turn these stem cells into a whole variety of other cell types, we use a cocktail that turns them into neurons that have cell bodies and axons and they communicate with each other. Okay, um, we can then use a small glass microelectrode to um, uh, record from these individual neurons. And we, when they're stimulated, it causes the sodium channels to open. And here is a trace that shows um, the charge transfer when these positively charged ions go from the outside of the cell to the inside of the cell. And um, basically they're going into the cell through the open sodium channel door. So there, the door is opening right here and it opens for a little while and then it shuts on itself. It basically has like a spring. Okay. so. How we um, are thinking about this is, let's say we have a mutation in a sodium channel 
that partially blocks the channel when it opens. So when we record the charge that goes across the membrane, you can see that less charge went across the membrane when the channel opened because these traces are smaller than these traces. And in this case, there, this partial blockade causes less sodium to go through the cell um, through this broken door. Okay, or we could have another patient where in fact, there was a mutation that caused the channel to stay open longer than it normally would. And so then when you recorded the, uh, uh, the traces associated with opening the channels, what you would see is a much more sodium ions, or many more sodium ions coming in compared to the unbroken channel. Okay. Um, to start our studies looking at how specific mutations break sodium channels, we started with a large family that had been diagnosed with epilepsy in many of its um, uh, of the individuals. So you can see the uh, starting uh, couple uh, the, um, did not does not have epilepsy because that's indicated by the open symbols. And in fact, epilepsy doesn't show up in the first generation, but it does uh, show up robustly in the second and later generations. And that's indicated by every symbol that has is dark. That's an individual that has epilepsy. Um, this was a very large family and these doctors were able to um, uh, sequence the genome of many of the individuals that did not have epilepsy as well as many of those that did have, have epilepsy. And what they found was there was a single mistake in the sodium channel gene in every relative that had epilepsy. And it was that mistake was not in the um, relatives that did not have epilepsy. So that's a really good indication that this mutation is causing this epilepsy, but we don't know how it's doing it. Okay, so we were super lucky to get in touch with these doctors and we um, asked them if they could give us um, a skin biopsy from some patients and they were able to get a skin biopsy from two brothers, one with epilepsy and one, one with epilepsy here in the dark and one without ep epilepsy. The next step in this then was to take the cells from the unaffected brother, we reprogrammed them, made them into stem cells, and we took cells from the brother with epilepsy, and we also reprogrammed and made them into cells. So now we have two cell lines, one um, without the epilepsy mutation and one with the epilepsy mutation. And we did two other steps. The first was we used a gene editing tool, CRISPR-Cas9, to introduce the mutation that was found in this family into these stem cells. And so now these cells are identical to the unaffected brother stem cells, except that they have that single mutation added. And we also um, did the same strategy for the cell line made from the epilepsy brother. We actually use gene editing to remove the mutation and replace it with the corrected um, sequence. And so now we have four sets of, or, or two pairs of cells um, in this cell line, epilepsy mutation added and the epilepsy brother. They both carry exactly the same mutation. And we're going to compare the sodium currents in these to the unaffected brother that does not have the mutation or the cell line made when the mutation was corrected. And what we are looking for are changes that occur both in both cell lines that have the mutation that are different from both cell lines that don't have the mutation. So here are the results. We looked at sodium currents in the neurons derived from these stem cell pairs. So I'm gonna first show you the one from the unaffected brother and here are the sodium currents and these are um, typical sodium currents and you see they're quite large. And if they're compared to the sodium currents in the neurons where the epilepsy mutation was added, you can see the size of the sodium currents is smaller. We also then looked at the brother with epilepsy and the sodium currents um, in those neurons, and they were small compared 
to the matched um, cell line where the mutation was corrected. So this tells us that this epilepsy mutation reduces the number of ions that um, can enter the cell when the sodium channel door is opened. So our conclusions are that the sodium channel mutation in this family um, reduces sodium currents in neurons. So when the sodium channel door is opened, it does not let enough sodium ions in. Now, this creates for us a great tool to use these cells to screen for drugs that affect the flow of sodium ions into the cell to reduce the seizures. So in this case, we would want to do something that increases the flow of sodium ions. So we would like to prop the sodium channel door open for longer. We would like to force it to open wider, or we could even use strategies to try and make a new, new sodium channel doors that would then replace the um, defective ones. So I think this is super exciting. Um, these are um, cells from individual patients, and you could do this for any patient that has a genetic epilepsy. Um, before I stop, I want to thank my fabulous team, um, particularly Yan Yao Ji, um, who is a former graduate student, now a postdoc at Cold Spring Harbor, and Nathan Eng, who is a former undergraduate and is now um, a completing medical school at Stanford. And those two did all of the recordings from the um, stem cells and the neurons derived from them. And Olga Safrina is my senior lab technician who um, created all the stem cell lines and did all the gene editing. And so with that, I will stop and I think we can take questions. That was fantastic, um, both of you, just so clear and easy to understand. Dr. Lin, um, if I could invite you to exactly share your video. Um, and at this point, I would love to hear what questions um, the audience has. I know that Jack has answered a couple on the side, but let me just kick off a little bit in case not everyone is monitoring those Q&A questions that are coming in. Um, I'm gonna re-ask um, uh, one or two of those while there may be additional questions that are arriving. And um, to phrase it maybe a little bit more broadly to you, Dr. Lin, can toxins cause epilepsy in humans and maybe more specifically, the same kinds of toxins that have um, affected the sea life that you've talked to talked to us about tonight. Can, has, is that known to be a cause for epilepsy in humans? Well, um, it's not typically the cause of epilepsy in humans. And we, I imagine that sea lions, they have sort of a limited diet of, of sardines and so forth, and they're in restricted environments. So they are ingesting large quantity of this type of, you know, this, this, this toxin is, is closely related to an, a type of, of toxin that we use to induce animal models of, of epilepsy. It's similar to something called canic acid, which we use to in rodents to induce epilepsy. So this type of toxin is specifically targeting a certain part of the brain. And the, I, the point of this is that this type of toxin creates a model similar to what Dr. O'Dell is talking about. So that we can study treatments uh, um, to effectively cure epilepsy. Perfect. So um, then we have a couple of more questions that are sneaking in here. And um, Dr. O'Dowd, if I could direct this to you, have you looked at other sorts of epilepsy mutations? And are there, I'm gonna broaden that just a little bit based on some of the other questions that are coming in. And are there similar mechanisms that, that are involved to the kind of propping the door open or, or um, okay, go ahead. Yeah, absolutely. So we have looked at um, uh, seven different uh, si uh, single mutations in a variety of different uh, model systems. What's really cool is we're able not only to look at the effect of these mutations in human stem cells, but we look at the same mutations in a mouse model and a fruit fly model. And where we see changes that are consistent with three models gives us a lot of confidence that that actually is um, a mechanism that is contributing to the human uh, disease. And so we have um, two groups of mutations that we've seen. One that causes just what I showed you with that, uh, with the example that I showed where there was a decrease 
in the amplitude of the sodium currents. We've seen other ones that cause the sodium channels to stay open too long. Both of them result in, and these both happen in the inhibitory um, circuits in the brain. And so when you re re um, change activity there, you affect overall network activity that causes um, too much excitation. So there's two, two basic classes of mechanisms, but they're different in that one of them, for example, we see is very sensitive to heat. And these are associated with uh, people that have febrile seizures. So your temperature goes up and you have a seizure. We have one set of mutations that actually looks pretty good in the cells. The sodium channels work fine at, room te uh, at body temperature, but when you heat them up above body temperature, then they don't work so well. And so, and we have another set that are messed up um, at body temperature, even though they have um, febrile seizures and we think there's an interaction with another temperature sensitive component. So that, that's great. You actually anticipated another question that we got in, in terms of your answer about the different sorts of mechanisms, you know, too much or too little. And the issue being that it, it's the balance in terms of the function of, of the neuron. So let me just take and, and twist that a little bit. And Dr. Lin, come back to you because in your clinical, your presentation of, of, from the clinical side, you mentioned the challenge of identifying treatments and trying many different sorts of drugs for individuals to um, trying to get to something that, that's going to give some relief. And I wonder if maybe you just want to comment on um, idiopathic seizures and or idiopathic epilepsy when we don't know what the genetic mutation is and what's going on with the balance of the neuron. And how do you progress through that to think about trying to restore the inhibitory and excitatory balance in, in a way that's going to be meaningful for your patients? Yeah, that's a good question. And, and, and I think that all comes down to to uh, um, understanding, you have a good model of epilepsy and Dr. O'Dell and others are doing a great job. So I'm just going to wear my scientist hat a little bit because that's on, sort of on the other side as well. And the idea is that the current model of epilepsy is in, in, insufficient to model the human uh, epilepsy. For once, you know, the human, we, we have spontaneous seizures and these are sort of induced seizures and, and human epilepsy is a chronic condition while a lot of the models of epilepsy are acute conditions. So, so I think that moving forward, um, you know, if, if we just screen drugs with a current type of model that is not sort of precision medicine type of model, then it's sort of garbage in, garbage out. And this is why even though the newer medicine in general are better tolerated, have less side effect, you don't have to get drug levels, on the other hand, the efficacy has not changed over 30, 40 years, right? So I think we have a perfect follow-on question from that that's come in also from the audience. And that's, could you use the kinds of technology that Dr. O'Dowd is talking about to move towards precision medicine, right? To do screening that's in an induced pluripotent stem cell that's been generated from patients so that you're targeting in a patient specific way and understanding mechanism better at the outset. Yeah, I think that's that's a, you know one way of, of doing it. One of the challenges is that most epilepsy is not genetically, uh, um, at least there's not a, a clear, you know, single low side locus kind of, of de defect like causing like a sodium channel. Those are very much in the minority. Ninety five percent or even more patients that I see, even if you do a very comprehensive screen for genetic causes, you're just not going to find them. So, so one way is to do the precision medicine, but the other way is to rescue these cells, much similar to what you talked about with Parkinson's and other degenerative neurological disorders and treat it in a different way, right? So. Right. So, um, and I'm sorry, Diane, I'll come back to you in just one second, but we have another question that really bridges on that um, very well, which is probably the broadest way that I could ask it is to just say, what, what do you think the, the potential is, the prognosis is to be able to treat epilepsy by something by like stem cell transplants, right? Where you're looking for an alternative mechanism to just restore balance in terms of inhibitory processes. Yeah, I think, I, you know, we need to push further, you know, in, in, in this uh, realm because right now, surgery, you know, removing 
tissue is, is, is currently the only method of restoring balance in these very difficult to treat people and bring their, their, their lives back. But it comes with cost. There's no sort of tissue that you can expandable and you can just give, give away. So, so because of that, you know, we need to sort of follow some of the lead of some of the other neurodegenerative you know, um, treatment and push forward with. This really hasn't been explored very much in the epilepsy clinical world. And I think that there's so much more room for research. Thank you so much for those answers. Um, Dr. O'Dowd, just turning back to you um, quickly. I know that we know from Dr. Lin's comments that the um, genetic identifiers, genetic mutations are gonna be a minority of um, epilepsy patients for epilepsy patients that are out there. Um, but the question that was asked is how many sodium channel mutations are we aware of and as, as researchers in the field that are linked to epilepsy so far? Over 1,500 in the, uh, in the one gene I'm talking about, SCN1A, and there are two other sodium channel genes, um, SCN8 and um, 2, that also have some mutations. But SCN1A is a hotspot. And about 30% of the epilepsies have a defined genetic component. But it is a, a much smaller percentage than um, the other um, aspects. But I still think um, understanding at the cellular level, what are the types of possibilities of alterations in sodium channel function can really help us address some of the other um, epilepsies as well in a broader fashion. And I see yes. there's a question that says, are there any applications where we could utilize machine learning or AI to analyze data in this field? And we just have some really exciting research that was supported by the Stem Cell Seed Grant Program, which Yay. was <laughs> to um, allow us to grow our cells on multi-electrode arrays. So we don't just go in and query a single cell and find out what it's doing. We look at activity of the whole network. And um, we have some really interesting results from that with these um, same cells that we've looked at in the individual, um, uh, individual cell level. So I think that's the place where, in fact, network activity is really important to be able to look at um, large amounts of data and how um, balance of activity is affected by temperature or by drugs, et cetera. And I think um, AI uh, um, is the type of uh, thing that may help us with that. Fantastic. Of course, I'm thrilled to hear that in terms of updates for your research. Um, I think we have one, well, a number, but one that I would pick out right now, kind of uh, extension of that question, which is in the translational pipeline for where things are right now, where is the technology for being able to think about gene editing, for example, in that shockingly large number of, you know, sodium channel mutations that have been identified, is it viable when you have a, a kindred, a family like you've described, where there's such a strong pattern of inheritance? Is gene therapy something that could be considered, you know, the way that we're doing this for sickle cell anemia or alpha thalassemia at this point? Um, I, I think it is a possibility, but I um, am not entirely, I don't think we're there yet um, in terms of looking at the epilepsy mutations because that family that has, has 27 members of that family have epilepsy. Most of the genetic cases of epilepsy that we know of have maybe five family members or six family members affected. And so it's not as um, straightforward to look at. Great. So um, turning the topic, I think maybe just slightly, Dr. Lin, um, there's a question I think that falls into your camp. Um, how, I'm gonna try and just read it straight up. How are you sure that patients who undergo surgery, so for example, removal of a region of their brain as a, a therapy for epilepsy, won't suffer from different diseases or conditions or complications from the absence of that excised region? And I think that comes back to the point that you were just making a moment ago. So maybe just say a few more words um, for folks on that score. Yeah, I mean, so let me just sort of tell a brief story about a patient that we operate on. Um, and that is a patient, sometimes we have seizures come from the language area and we map that area and long and behold, that area was 
you know, response for that person speaking uh, verbal output. And it turned out that, that when we told the patient that we won't want to operate on you because of this area, this patient said, I'd rather lose my ability to talk than have continuous daily seizures. So this is really highlight the point that epilepsy is a very severe disabling seizure. Luckily, you know, it was one of the cases that we presented, uh, we wrote it up in, for publication that um, uh, showed that over time the brain is very plastic. And this person actually able to regain single word speech into sentences and she continues to be seizure free. So you're right, there's no expandable brain, uh, but when you look about the balance of severity of epilepsy and how it robs people's, young people's life especially, it is really devastating. And, and uh, they will go through surgery to gain their life back, like Jasmine. That's a, that's a great um, vignette, I, I think, in terms of how devastating um, this type of neurological condition can be. And of course, it's something that's really challenging um, in the case of neurological conditions. I mean, maybe just a, a word for people broadly in terms of understanding the promise of regenerative medicine. This is something that folks have worked on for, you know, 30 years, 40 years, going back to Parkinson's disease, the idea of being able to do cell transplants into situations where we largely know what's wrong. There's an imbalance. There's a, a loss of a neurotransmitter to be restored, the need to have an increase in inhibitory activity to tone down seizures. And um, this seemed like at one point it would be a simple mark to hit and, and it's not, right? The field has not progressed as rapidly as we all hope, but we do hope that with these kinds of single cell level of understanding, understanding the genetics and how different drugs are working on different sorts of cells, how we can bring models into a dish using cell therapy and uh, the generation of stem cells as a technology that we're really poised to be able to make some advances. And certainly this is what um, we hope. And while neurological diseases have proved to be a tough nut to crack, for us, that's a big part of what we do in the Stem Cell Research Center. Many of our researchers work in that domain. And it is a large component of the funding that the California Institute for Institute for Regenerative Medicine is gonna be investing in regenerative medicine research over the next 10 and 15 years. So hopefully we'll be able to get some traction there. Um, it looks like our questions have slowed down. I have just one left that I'll, I'll pose to, to both of you um, because I think it does affect cell models. And in, in fact, I know that it affects animal models of all sorts of neurological conditions, epilepsy included. And I'm sure there's a clinical story to that as well. And that is, does epilepsy affect males and females differently? Um, so I'll quickly say that there are types of epilepsy that certainly uh, um, there's a big interaction between um, hormones and, and epilepsy. So there's a type of epilepsy called catamenial epilepsy. And it turned out that estrogen is pro-convulsive and progesterone is somewhat anti-convulsive. And there are women who will have seizures very much tightly locked to the time of the menstrual period. And they are very disabling during that period of time. And so, you know, so unfortunately therapy for hormone to control uh, um, these uh, uh, seizures haven't been successful. Uh, and so maybe the story is even more complicated uh, than just the hormone story. And I think from our studies, the mutations that we've looked at are mutations that um, occur at equal frequency in the males and females that have them. And that we, um, uh, I don't think that there's any evidence that there is a difference um, but, um, in terms of their presentation, but we have in the one that I showed you, we've only had, we had two brothers. We didn't have, um, there was no um, sister sibling there. So we weren't able to look at that, but I was really interested in, I would have liked to have looked at um, a sister, but it was good that we had two brothers, one with epilepsy and one without as a better control. Okay, so I think we have covered uh, the majority of our questions here tonight. I apologize if, if I happen to have missed one, but I, I don't think that I did. Um, I just wanna point out uh, for you, Diane, that the question about machine learning actually was asked by a high school student in one of the labs within the Stem Cell Research Center. So a shout out to the 
very sophisticated level of questions that we get from our high school students when they participate. Um, thanks very much to the two of you for your time this evening for just some really outstanding and super clear and, and tractable presentations and very uh, a very huge shout out and thanks to our audience for joining us tonight. I hope to see you again towards the end of the month when we have Lorenz Studer joining us. So good night and thanks very much. <laughs>